too crowded for me. I don't like to try to cover too much information in a short time because it's hard enough for us to remember, you know, the, the smaller amounts at a time. And, and uh, so I appreciate that. Now, if you would, open your Bible uh, with me and uh, let's kind of review what we studied last Sunday. Uh, and certainly we need to know what the church is, where it came from, uh, to appreciate the church. If we never talk about this institution, how that it was founded, we lose respect for it. Uh, history is so important in anything, and that's one of the biggest problems we have in America now is people don't know American history. Uh, my nephew, uh, Roy, uh, He's uh, my nephew's, he'd be a great nephew, my nephew Jason's, Lynn's son, was, Lynn was here at our anniversary, his son is Jason, Jason's son is Roy, is graduating from the 12th grade now, all homeschooling, and uh, uh, Gene is going to be telling the Awanas tonight about the award that he won, and another young lady won as well, from the Awana ministry that's almost unheard of, Hard, very few ever earn it. And uh, she's going to tell more about that. But uh, homeschooling is one of the greatest things in America. Uh, the spelling contests that they have back in Washington, D.C., it seems like most of the winners are homeschooled people. You know, we've forgotten to teach these kids uh, mathematics or arithmetic and reading and writing like we used to, the, the basics. And in too many cases, other things are being substituted, the, the environment movement and a lot of these other things. Uh, that are being uh, substituted, uh, which uh, is really a tragedy. And very few of our students are learning about the founders. And when they do hear about George Washington and some of these great people in history, many times it's in a derogatory way. Uh, history has been rewritten, and we need to know history in America, and that's one of the big problems we're having right now, that we don't know American history like we should. Uh, and uh, that's the same thing is true in the church. If we just assume we don't know where the church came from and, and here we are at a church today, if we don't appreciate where it came from and who founded it, uh, it takes away a lot of things uh, from it. So I want to just kind of share with you what I covered last Sunday and, and then we'll pick up from where we left off. In Luke 6, 12 and 13, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. So there were many disciples, many that followed Jesus when he was upon the earth, but out of those he chose only twelve to be apostles. Now this is significant because of other scripture. The greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church there, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So the first thing that he said here that God uh, has set in the church is apostle. Now another scripture is Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, here the apostle is mentioned first of all of these gifts to the church. These were people that were gifts to the church. The apostle is a gift. The prophet a gift. The evangelist a gift. Pastors a gift. Teachers a gift. God gives these to the church. And we ought not to abuse the gifts that God gives to the church. Now, there are gifts of the Spirit. That's different from what these gifts are. And when we sang Looking for a Touch of Heaven this morning, that's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. But then there's also the gifts of the Spirit that's enumerated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, earlier uh, in, yes, 1 Corinthians 12, earlier in that chapter that I read from uh, just a moment ago. Now, <clears throat> we read in the scriptures of the church being founded. When we come to the book of Acts, the church was already in existence. Jesus had chosen those 12 and named them apostles. That was the establishment of the church. Right here we see in these two scriptures, first apostles, first apostles. Jesus did not leave it up to 
the apostles to start the church. He had already established the church uh, when the day of Pentecost came. And my grandmother, my little grandmother, was a missionary Baptist from Kentucky, and she was quite a theologian, actually. And uh, she told me one day, said, uh, how can you add to something if it isn't there? Because I was having a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little bit of a, uh, in my mind, was having this battle back and forth. Is the church universal, invisible, or is it local? And uh, I had to come to the realization that the church today, now in, in in, in uh, prospect, it's going to be made up of all believers in heaven. But the church today is a local called out assembly. That's the body of Christ. And my little grandmother said, how can you add? Because it says on the day of Pentecost, they were added to the church. How can you add to something that ain't there? <laughs> you know, just pretty good, simple logic. Uh, and so the church was already in existence on the day of Pentecost. And then when Peter preached, there were 3,000 people saved and baptized and added to the church, according to Acts 2, 41. In the book of Acts, there are 13 great prayer meetings. There are nine great revivals, and there are 10 great sermons in this one book of the Bible. Think of it. 13 prayer meetings, nine revivals, 10 sermons in this one book. And that's why that church was so anointed and so empowered to win people to Christ. That's where the missionaries were first sent out in Acts 13, talking about Paul and Silas going out. The church sent them out as missionaries. And the outline of the book of Acts, as you see in your notes, first of all, the Lord going up. That happened in uh, chapter 1. And then the Holy Spirit coming down. That happened in chapter 2. And then thirdly, the church going out, beginning in chapter 2, verse 46, through the entire remainder of the book of Acts. The church is going out. Uh, you shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. That's the key verse to the book of Acts. And that's our mission verse, by the way, here at uh, Redondo Hills. And then in chapter 5, verse 42... It says, and daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. May God help us to be like that church. May God help us to be a church that daily in the temple and every house ceases not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Our ministry as a church is not to preach uh, uh, in environmentalism and and uh, socialism and, and uh, a lot of these other things that churches get caught up in. And a lot of good things, there are a lot of good things that churches do. A lot of good things. But those are sidebars. They're not, they're the sidelines. The purpose of the church in the world today is to preach and teach Jesus Christ. Daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. If we're too busy, too occupied to do that, then we really don't have a right to even exist as a church. And I believe that's why a lot of churches have lost their light and they're, they're closed. According to Revelation, that can happen. If the Lord closes the door, no man can open it. And so one way we can be sure that we'll stay in existence as a church is doing what he told us to do. <laughs> Amen? Teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now the first uh, three or four points, how many was it? I think it was uh, three that I gave last week, or four, I'm sorry, four. The first point was it received, and you'll see these in your notes, this church received persecution. Secondly, this church knew what to do. Thirdly, this church had unity. And fourthly, this church had power in the pulpit. That's, these are characteristics of a great church. Now we're going to continue on now. Number five, in your notes, it had sacrificial givers. Sacrificial givers. And this is in Acts 4.34. This is the fifth characteristic of a great church. A church that's outstanding. A church that's unusual. That's really different from the norm. This church had sacrificial givers. And it says that in Acts 4.34, Neither was there any among them that lacked... For as many as were possessors of lands or houses 
sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Now there was no one in the church that was going hungry because the people would sell what they had and bring what they received from selling and then the, the apostles would take that and would distribute it to the widows, to the people that had need. Now this was the way that God planned for his church, not through the government redistribution. And uh, government, no matter uh, how good it starts out, eventually will become corrupt as it is today, very corrupt today. Uh, probably the most corrupt it's ever been. Uh, and uh, uh, that's not an opinion, that's just stating the facts. We, we, you know, the government's never been told by God to take care of the people like this, redistribution. But the church, they weren't commanded to, to do this either. They did it voluntarily. One of the funniest things I heard this last week, one of the congressmen said that our tax system's voluntary and the IRS commissioner said, yes, it's voluntary. I would like to see how many of us... <laughs> If we don't send our taxes in, see how voluntary it is. Yeah. Amen. That was the biggest joke, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, people leave, live in fear <laughs> uh, of that, don't they? And so we as God's people, we, we render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and under God, but we don't like to have Caesar stealing from us either. Uh, they had sacrificial givers, not because they had to or even told to, but because they loved God and they chose to do this. They sold their land, they brought whatever they had and, and gave it to the apostles to, uh, to administer among the people. There's no record of being commanded to do this, but they were motivated by the Holy Spirit to do it. Now, I wonder a question. Would we yield all of our worldly possessions to allow the gospel to be preached? It's sad, but some won't support what we're getting with the tithe now, you see. It's sad. But in our church, I think we have a tremendous... Uh, God has blessed this church, uh, well, before I came here. The Lord has always blessed in, uh, this church, uh, Church of Redondo Hills, uh, with the needs being met. And there, there aren't very many churches in America that could say they have the property we have, which... It's two to three million dollars, I would imagine. I, we haven't had it praised recently, and uh, to owe twenty-eight thousand dollars. I mean, that's something when you think about the house, the pastorium, and the property here that the church has. It's amazing. It's just uh, wonderful how God has provided. When we came here, there was uh, some owed, but I don't remember how much. Then we took out a loan of sixty thousand dollars sometime after we came on the field in the nineties. And we put up a fence and we did a whole lot of things with that. Uh, and we've been paying on that ever since. And now it's less than 30000 about somewhere around 28000 And so what we're going to be doing real soon is uh, we're going to be having a meter, a faith meter we'll call it up here. And we're going to set it up to where it'll go from 28000 down to zero. And our goal is by uh, a year from this next March, it would be our 25th anniversary, Gene and I coming on the field, uh, we want to have it paid off by then. And uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is just put a little bit each week on my check. Add a little bit. You know, if you put $5 a week, uh, counting up 52 weeks, that's $260 or somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, that adds up, doesn't it? Just a little bit a week going to the mortgage. And so if you do that, make sure you mark the envelope mortgage. That's what we're going to have that as a mortgage fund. And we're going to add that on to the payment that we make every month which is, uh, I think, $650 somewhere in that ballpark, isn't it? Five-something. Five, Five? 556 Okay, so we'll add whatever comes in, we'll add that on to that 556 So let's say $200 came in a month. We'd add that on, make $756. We'll send in on the mortgage. And each month when we get the payoff back, we'll, we'll bring that red thing down and, it'll, and we'll let everybody know exactly how much left we have to go to pay that mortgage off. I think it'd be great if we, we had that completely paid off. So that's what the challenge we have before us now <laughs> in the near future. And I think it's a great testimony when a church can do that. And then uh, let's go on to the next point. Number six, it judged sin in it. This church, this church, a characteristic of a great church, this church judged sin in it. 
This, now, this is one of the hardest things to do for a church. This church judged sin in it. Let's look at Acts 5. Acts 5, verse 1. But a certain man, a man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. Now, keep in your mind what the church had been doing. They were selling lands and taking the possessions and... and uh, and giving so that everybody could have their needs met. There were, uh, uh, neither was there any among them that lacked, according to chapter 4, verse 34. And so in chapter 5, it's telling about Ananias and Sapphira. It says in verse 2 of chapter 5, kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. Now this would be like a conspiracy. They were conspiring together to do this. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, I'll tell you what, don't ever fool around lying to the Holy Ghost. This is the kind of thing that can happen. This was a sin against the Holy Spirit. And in verse 4, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? And why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in and Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. It was the same amount. They would had agreed together. They're going to say the same amount. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold the feet of them which have Buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and wound her up. So these were pallbearers in essence is what they were. These young men came in and uh, they found her dead, carried her out and uh, buried her by her husband. Uh, Talking about Kentucky and my grandmother, that church where she was raised, uh, we were there one time, Dawson Springs, Kentucky, a uh, little church out in the country, and there was a cemetery right next door. And uh, that was the custom in those days. Uh, the cemeteries mostly were by the churches like that. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the Catholic church still have their cemeteries, you know, separate most of the time from other cemeteries. And uh, over in Orange County, there is a Southern Baptist uh, cemetery there that m many of the people use. But here was two people who conspired, Ananias and Sapphira. Now, they, they, uh, they didn't want to look like they weren't doing as much as everybody else. So they said, well, he said, honey, why don't we just keep back a little? We can keep a little of this money. We'll just tell them that we gave it all when we really haven't. They'll never know the difference. And she said, all right. So they said, how much are we going to say? And they agreed on the amount. So he did first, and she wasn't there. He did, told them what it was, and Peter said, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. He dropped down dead. They buried him. She comes three hours, had the same story. She dropped down dead. You see, God judged sin in the midst. And this is one concept we've forgotten about in our churches and in America today about the judgment of God. You know what? I believe God's judgment is a lot nearer than we think. I, I'm shudder to think. And my main concern isn't for me, but for my children and grandchildren, for the young people. But I believe God's judgment is very, it's very close to our nation. And we need to pray. We need to be faithful. We need to stand up. I want it, when I stand before Christ, I want to be able to say, I did what you told me to do. Uh, that I stood up for what was right. And the Bible does say this in 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. 
Judgment begins at the house of God. And that's what happened there in Jerusalem. And the Bible talks much about the discipline in the church. The Bible says in Revelation 3, 19, God chastens those he loves. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 16, that there is a sin unto death. It says this, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. And one of the admonitions of Paul to the church in Corinth about communion, the Lord's Supper, is don't take it but unworthily. He said sometimes it can be, you can become weak and sickly, and some people even sleep. In other words, they've died because of taking of the Lord's Supper unworthily. They took it without a, a clarity of thought and purpose. They just rushed through it and, and, and uh, they had sin in their life, but they wouldn't confess it. They were full of pride and just went ahead and took it anyway. You see, God is a holy God. Yes, He's a God of love, but God doesn't wink at you and say, all right, just go ahead and do it. No. I'll overlook it this time. You know, he, doesn't, he doesn't do that. He keeps the records. And He is a God of love, yes, but he's a, His love is holy. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You see, he didn't say, all right, I, I love you and I'm just going to look the other way and let you get by. No, he couldn't do that because he couldn't save anybody then because he wouldn't be a holy God. He had to maintain his holiness. That's why Jesus, it was necessary for his only son whom he loved so dearly to die on Calvary, the just for the unjust. That's why it was necessary for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God judged the sin in it. That's another characteristic of a great church. God judges the sin. This church judged the sin in it. God took care of it. Then number seven, this church feared God. This is as a result of what happened to Ananias and Sapphira, that both of them died and were carried out to be buried. As a result of this Judgment of sin, the Bible says in verse 11, And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. I would say, and I think if you're really honest, you'd have to agree that there's very little fear of God in the churches of America and anywhere in America. Uh, there's blasphemy of God, getting up before a Planned Parenthood that uh, major in killing babies and that... Uh, uh, had something to do with that uh, terrible, this man was found guilty this, back in Philadelphia for at least three babies that he killed after they come out of the womb, plus manslaughter and the death of a, one of the mothers. They found him guilty, as you saw in the news, and he was put for life in prison. Now there's a man in Houston that has just as bad as that, and maybe even worse, where he's twisted the heads off of babies. I mean, it's gruesome to even talk about it. And yet, Planned Parenthood stands up for it. And yet, to have the president get up and say, God bless you, that's, I think that's kind of like blasphemy, really. Uh, I, I tell you, it feared God. This church feared God. Where's the fear of God before our eyes today? And when I say fear, I'm talking about reverence, respect. Uh, when it's, instead of that, we see people laughing in the modern culture, making fun of Christians. And uh, I, I can tell you 100% unequivocal that the IRS would not have done what they did to the Christians and uh, Billy Graham and James Dobson, the Tea Parties, they would not have done that against a Muslim group anywhere in this nation. They would not have done that. We're living in precarious days, folks, and I don't want to try to be alarmist. You know, I'd like to be able to talk about, you know, smiley face, real, you know, positive things, but we need to be realistic, too, honest, too, about the situation we are faced with. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 9, verse 10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. It's the fear of the Lord. Why don't we have more wisdom in our school system? All of the great schools go back to the Ivy League. Every one of them was started as a Christian organization. Universities, Harvard, all of them. And now they're nothing but uh, 
full of liberalism, anti-God, all that kind of thing. Turned upside down. Proverbs 3 and verse 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Proverbs said. Now what kind of a church would this be if every member were just like me? That's the question I want to ask myself. You need to ask yourself that. What kind of a church would Redondo Hills be if every member and the tenders, the people that support this church are just like me? Would, uh, are, would that be good or bad? We all need to do a little introspection. Am I a help to the work of the Lord or am I a hindrance to the work of the Lord? You know, everyone is one or the other. And I want to be a blessing to you and I trust that you want to be a blessing to others and to each other. We need to help each other. We need to encourage each other. Instead of killing off the wounded, we need to lift them up and apply the balm of Gilead and help one another. We're in this thing together. And we need to help each other. When one member suffers, the whole body suffers. When one member rejoices, the whole body rejoices. Amen. May God bless each one. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are in need, so much in need of your help today as a church, as families, as individuals, and as a nation. Oh God, help us to be the kind of believers, to be the kind of Americans, the kind of people who love this nation with all of our heart, to pray for it, and then to stand. Even, Lord, if we become intimidated ourselves, the day may come. Will there be a knock at the door or uh, something for us? Lord, we don't know. But God, it's a possibility. The more we see now, the more we realize it's a very real possibility. Help our nation to be spared from that. Help the Congress people, men and women, to stand for the people of this country and not to be just politicians to go along to get along. Lord God, help the judges to wake up and to realize the, the state of the country is right now. And if we go down, we'll all go down together, Lord. So Lord, help us to stand. Lord, we need to pray for this nation. And God, help us to love you. Let us be obedient to you, faithful to you. That's the main reason we're in this world today, Lord. We love you and we want to be obedient to you. Lord, we know if we are, then we'll be better citizens. We'll be better husbands, wives, families, church. We'll put you first. And we thank you for it. Now with our heads bowed and eyes closed, are there believers that would say, God has spoken to my heart this morning. And please pray with me. And, I, and I'll pray with you. I want to pray with you because I want you to pray with for me too. Pray together that God will do what he wants to do in each of our lives and our families in the church and in this nation. Will you make a covenant with me to pray for that? Just pray together. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Now, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Are there those that God has spoken to your heart and you're not sure you're saved? If you died right now, you don't know that you'd go to heaven. And my friend, that's the first place. That's where it starts because we call it the new birth, being born again. If you've never been born again, if you're not sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, would you raise your hand and say, pray with me about that. I want, to, I want to know for sure that I'm saved, that Christ is my Lord and Savior, that I belong to Him and He belongs to me. Amen. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Just slip your hand up and say, pray with me about that need. Now, are there those that would say, God has spoken to my heart about baptism. Pray with me that I'll do what He wants me to do. About... Uh, Church membership, taking 101, the class that we've talked about earlier, and 201, these classes. God has spoken to your heart about one of these needs. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray with me about it. Amen. Amen. Anyone? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for each person here, for the hands that have been raised for prayer. And God, you see our hearts. We have, are completely aware of that and believe that with all of our heart, Lord. So, Lord, have your way in our lives. And uh, may we please you, and may we uh, bring honor and glory to your name. For it's in the precious name of Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we ask it and thank you for it. And everyone said together, amen, amen. amen.